In this test, you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your answers. In the IELTS listening test, the recording will be played once only. The test is in four sections. In the exam, you will be advised to write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will have ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now look at section one in your book. Section one. You are going to listen to a telephone conversation between a caller and a call center operator. As you listen, complete the numbered spaces in the identification form in the book. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Platinum Card Service, Rebecca speaking. How may I help you? I've got a few problems with my credit card account. Okay. What is your credit card number?、Mm, let's see. It's here somewhere. Ah, here it is. The identification and security check is for a platinum card service, so card has been written down in the space. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Platinum Card Service, Rebecca speaking. How may I help you? I've got a few problems with my credit card account. Okay, what is your credit card number?、Mm, let's see, it's here somewhere. Ah, here it is. Can I just take the card number, please? Yes, it's six double nine two. Six double nine two. Three double four three. Three double four three. Double one four seven. Double one four seven. Eight nine two one. Eight nine two one, right? Can I just check that? Um, six double nine two, three double four three, double one four seven, eight nine two one. That's it. And your name? Carlos de Silva. I just need to check a few details for identification and security, if you'll bear with me. That's okay. And what's your postcode? S E one eight P B. S E one eight P B. That's it. Foxall Close, London. Yes, that's right. And the house number. Um, forty three. And can you give me your date of birth? Thirteenth of the seventh, sixty three. And one further check, if I may. Can you give me your mother's maiden name? Yes, it's Moore. Is that M double O R E? Yes, that's it. Before the caller and operator continue their telephone conversation, look at questions six to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions six to ten. For these questions, there are three alternatives: A, B, and C. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. 
Yes. Now, can we get on with this? Yes, sir, certainly. I'm sure you'll appreciate that all these checks are necessary for security reasons. So, what exactly is the problem? Problems. Okay. Well, first, um, your computer seems to have gone mad. I sent you £500, and on the statement for the account, it shows that I only paid £300. Yes. The account does only show £300 was paid. Well, I paid the £500 in at the bank, and I have my receipt, and my bank statement shows that £500 has been taken from my account. Oh, I see. What I'll do is check with the bank and see what they say. OK. You said there was something else? Yes, as if that wasn't enough. My account shows that £107.27 was paid to a company called Pan Express. I don't know who this is. Let's have a look. Well, it is genuine. I can assure you it's not mine. It was made on the evening of the 12th of May. Maybe it's a restaurant bill you forgot about? There's no way that... Oh, oh wait, hold on. Yes. Oh, it's OK. I've just realised what it is. It is a restaurant bill. Um, the name of the company is different from the name of the restaurant. My mistake. I'm sorry. That's OK. Was there anything else? I don't know if I dare. What is it, anyway? Um, well, it's... um. The amount of interest seems to have gone up. Hmm. If you look at your statement for April, you'll see that the rate went down from 16.27% to 14.99% that month. Oh, yes, you're right. Was that everything? Yes, basically it is. OK. And can you check my payment? Oh, yes, I'll do it. Can I phone you back? I'll be at home for the next two hours. I have to leave at 11. Right. What's your number? 020-7989-7182. Hold on. 020-7979? No, it's 7989 and then 7182. So, it's 020 7989 7182. Yes, that's it. OK, I'll phone you straight back. Thanks. Bye. That's the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a radio interview about giving up smoking. First, look at questions 11 to 13. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. For these questions, there are four alternatives. A, B, C and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. And now, let's hear what Mr Gold has to say about kicking the habit of smoking. It was connected with wanting to change your life and your desire to become an actor. Is that right, Mr Gold? Um, yes. So, can you tell our listeners a bit more about how you managed to give up? Um, 
Well, I, I enrolled on a variety of evening courses where I found I wasn't able to do the warm-up sessions. Bending down to touch my toes made me breathless. Even though I hated to admit it, the problem wasn't so much my sitting around all the time, but my 15 to 20 a day smoking habit. If I'd been able to limit myself to three or four cigarettes a day, there'd have been no problem, but I was seriously addicted. And I'm talking about waking up at 3 a.m. dying for a cigarette, or, in the days before 24-hour shopping, driving across London at night to buy a packet of cigarettes when I ran out. But above all, my addiction meant making sure I never ran out, at the expense of everything else, including necessities. So what did you do? The thought of all my past attempts to give up just wouldn't go away. This was something that had constantly been on my mind, especially first thing in the morning with the chest pains, coughing fits and headaches, not to mention the frequent colds and throat infections. But I couldn't imagine life without smoking. I also enjoyed my life, but the thing I longed for most was to escape the trap of a job I was bored with. I knew what I wanted, and I understood something else, too. This time, I was going to keep my little plan a secret. Now look at questions 14 to 20. As the interview continues, complete the sentences. Write no more than three words for each answer. On the 1st of July, I managed to get through 24 hours without a single cigarette. The next day, I got to 48 hours. Then I aimed for 100, 500, 1,000. Easy. It was my own little private game, and I was winning it. If anyone mentioned they hadn't seen me smoking, I simply said I was cutting down. I had to be sure of success. Eventually, a month passed, and I felt safe enough to come out. <laughs> I'd lost count of the number of hours I'd gone without a cigarette. All I suffered was a couple of bad headaches, and then I was set for my most healthy year ever. Not one single cold for over 12 months. <laughs> I now realise that the secret of my success was to look upon this as an exciting adventure, a way of helping me to become an actor. And because nobody knew what I was up to, I never once feared the accusation of having no willpower if I failed. With the right attitude, the whole thing turned out to be a lot easier than expected. I finally did get into much better physical shape, go to drama school and become a professional actor. Very interesting indeed. <laughs> I'm sure we all wish we had Mr Gold's determination. Well, thank you very much, Mr Gold. And I hope our listeners will learn from the experience you and our other guests have talked to us about today and perhaps find their own road to success. That's the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between a tutor and two students. In the first part of the discussion, they talk about a fellow student. First, look at questions 21 to 23.
As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than two words for each answer. Ah, Francis and Steve, hi. Now, before we start the tutorial, am I right in thinking that you haven't heard about Lorraine? No. What about her? Um, she's already left. What? Well, she hasn't told anyone. You sound surprised. Weren't you half expecting it? Yes, but she could at least have told us, though. We've been on the course together for the past three years, and it would have been nice to know. She always was the sort to keep herself to herself. Yes, I know what you mean. Did she give any reason? Well, she got that job. What? Yes, and she's been given permission to leave, as there's only a week to go before the end of the course. But she'll be back for the exam week. Oh, well, we'll just have to catch her on the mobile after the class. She's gone back to Wales first. Oh, dear. We'll get hold of her on the mobile. She did say that it might not be possible to contact her for a couple of weeks. Oh, OK. If that is what she wants. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. The tutor and the two students are talking about assessment marks. For questions 24 to 30, there are four alternatives. A, B, C and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Right, to work. We're here to look at your assessment marks for your coursework. I take it you haven't seen them yet? No. <laughs> Not yet. Well, you'll both be pleased. In fact, very pleased. Yes. Francis, you have come out with the top mark in the year. Oh. You have, in fact, got a starred first. Wow. Aren't you pleased, Francis? Yes. I'm just speechless. <laughs> And um, what about me? Well, Steve, you got a first as well. <laughs> oh. I don't believe it. <laughs> you might have done even better, but there were a few faults with the 5,000-word project you did on traffic management. And what about the book review we had to do? Yours was, I can safely say, the best we have ever had. <laughs> You're kidding. I'm not. In fact, you have won the departmental prize for the piece. It's a pity, really, that your project wasn't of the same calibre. It's still not bad at all, though, is it? It certainly isn't. What do you think were the faults with your project? Uh, I just wasn't very happy with the conclusion, and I got myself in a bit of a twist with the argument about road pricing. By and large, your overall conclusions were OK, and I would say that your thoughts on road pricing were quite original. The problem was more with the actual end. It was a bit disappointing. You started off well, but then it ended rather suddenly, as if you got fed up with it. <laughs> yes, I did kind of stop fairly abruptly. I couldn't think of much to say, even though I knew it was important. Yes, that section needed a bit more work on it. But, as I said, by and large, it was very good. And, Francis, mm -hmm. your project was excellent. So much so that we think you should take it further, and perhaps do a PhD or at least an MPhil. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it. I've just been concerned with getting through this final year and getting all the coursework and exams out of the way. I can understand that. But I do think that you ought to consider it seriously. If you perform as well in your exams as in your project work, you're on course for a first. Do you think that I'd get funding for it? Well, any grant will be discretionary, but you have as good a chance as anyone else. 
I'd even say a much better one. Mm. If you do get a first, it'll be the only one we've had in this department for three years. And I'd be happy to be your supervisor. Thanks. I'd like that. Do you think I should start applying for it now or wait until after the exams? I think you must really start thinking about it as soon as you can.、Mm. And Steve, what about you? Have you thought about going on to do research? I have thought about it, but I have a job lined up if I get a good degree. And quite honestly, I am fed up with not having enough money to do the things I would like to do. <laughs> I can understand that. Is there anything that either of you would like to talk about? Yeah. I have a couple of things I'd like to ask, if you don't mind. OK. a y We have roughly、uh, 20 minutes left. So, Steve, would you like to go first? Right.、Um... That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Complete the notes made by one of the students present. Write no more than three words for each answer. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of,、um, of my being naive or over hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points.、Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes? Right, off we go. Now answer questions 34 to 40. Write no more than three words for each answer. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list 
is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management, it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now, the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and, perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes? Okay. You've got 20 minutes to do this. That's the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.